Uh, my presentation today is entitled Digitally Crafting uh, Tactile Learning Experiences. Um, it's something I've been working on with Dr. Diane Heath, also of Canterbury Christchurch University, um, on the, what you'll hear a bit more about, is the Medieval Animals Heritage in East Kent project. Um, it's a bit of a work in progress, and it's, it's part of me, I'm not actually gonna talk about sound for a change, yay, um, but it's about me kind of progressing through some ideas about tactile experiences, and how we can use them efficiently. So it builds very much on a couple of presentations I've given at CA UK in the past as well. Um, I don't know if you will have read uh, my title or anything useful like that, but um, the idea behind this paper, uh, by title I mean abstract, uh, was about thinking about sensory experience and engagement um, as essential parts of learning in the late 15th century. Uh, during this period of time, reduced levels of literacy, um, we very much relied on our other senses in addition to the visual to understand and engage with the world around us. Um, in this paper, I want to kind of lean on that and build on that as well. So there are kind of two sort of key elements and there's a couple of key references here that I want to talk about. This picture is a picture of the medieval kind of sensory map and the senses that are taken into consideration. So we're looking at more than just smell, touch, taste, sight, and the other one that I've completely forgotten at this moment in time. Um, <laughs> um, but we, we know some of these from a variety of land, um, manuscripts and things like that, that things like touch imprinted the messages of external senses on the internal ones and within the brain. So the value of touch is very, very high. Um, and virtues and holiness might also be uh, make a considerable impact towards touch or proximity. So what I'm trying to say here is that maybe we should be leaning on some of our other senses more when we're thinking about engagement. At the same time, we can also think about the value of sensory learning. So I'm not a child psychologist. I don't really work with children. I work with 3D printing. However, I have learned quite a lot in the last few months. Um, and one of the things I have learned, and that if you Google sensory learning, you'll realize there's a load of resources out there. If you try and look into the academic texts of uh, sensory learning and send students, there's even government papers about why this is such an important feature. It's a great way of facilitating exploration and encouraging children to use their senses to investigate. From the moment we're born, we use our senses to process and interpret the world around us. We know that research, from research, that sensory play is crucial for the development of all children, but it's particularly valuable for children um, with SEN, so uh, a variety of, I can't think of, uh, special educational needs um, and other disabilities who face additional barriers to learning. Receiving appropriate sensory stimulation helps them self-occupy, experience positive emotions and bring about relaxation all the while improving their ability to cope with seemingly normal experiences. So from here, we can understand that using our other sensories beyond just the expect expectation of looking and listening can really help um, our learning. Which builds beyond to medieval animals. It's all going to come together beautifully at the end, I think. Uh, it sounds a bit like incoherent in a few different places. So um, when I came to Canterbury Christchurch, this incredible project, Medieval Animals Heritage Project in East Kent, um, had just gained a load of money, I should probably put that in a more formal way, from the National <laughs> Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, and this project, run by Dr Diane Heath, who has been kind enough to uh, allow me to explore the project with her, um, brings together surviving different um, aspects of heritage, uh, from misery cords to minster, to wolves in the wildwoods, to sort of local zoo, zoo archaeology, so animal animal material culture that may be housed in museums such as, I've never been here, but I'm very excited to go at some point, Powell Cotton Museum, which currently has an incredible collection of taxidermy out there, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but to create a reliable and coherent account that will lay the foundation for future generations to enjoy. We know from the annual um, annuals of St Anselm, um, that there are various beastry tropes and beautiful medieval, medieval churches with animal art. Um, and these were sort of championed as uh, a way of appealing to local lay people as well, of engaging sort of with their heritage and with the world around them. Um, so that, um, so Diane's project aims to combine this kind of appeal for animals that we see in the past, with the same kind of appeal for animals that children and people with sound disabilities engage with the present, um, to look at different ways of heritage learning, meaning everyone can enjoy sort of working with heritage um, in sort of different ways 
despite whatever challenges and barriers they, uh, they, they face. Um, so it's kind of the idea of bringing together sort of all sorts of medieval ideas, different ideas of heritage, to create a whole series of, sort of workshops or engagements uh, with people for some activities, but also with children as well. Um, so 3D printing, where am I all going with this? 3D printing. We've heard already today from the wonderful Dr. Riley about the idea of digital objects. So digital, that, mer that merge between physical and digital objects. So 3D printing, it allows us to, I, I hate using the word replicate when I'm talking about 3D printing, but it allows us to create material, those things that have been digital, which then have been uh, physical in the first instance. So we have a whole kind of oh, difficult kind of meta idea of where the material and the digital merge in one place. Um, I think it really gives us an idea that maybe there is such a thing as digital materiality and we can engage a lot more in that kind of concept as well. Um, 3D printing is very much coming through kind of the, uh, I uh, can't remember his name, oh, sorry about me. this kind of emerging technological hype cycle. We got really, really excited about it and then the kind of its use has trailed off and I think we're only now just starting to sort of think about this in a bit more detail. Um, and I must admit, my paper here is very much, I kind of felt I had to give this because back in 2018, was it 2018? Was it 2017 when we were here for the last pet? It was 18, it was 2018 we were here for CAA Edinburgh for the first time. Um, I had just finished a uh, short contract at the University of York. I was staring... Um, unemployment down the barrel. I was very, very grumpy and uh, very, very tired. And there was a load of papers celebrating uh, photogrammetry, strong promotion, all of these things. And the end of all these papers, they said, oh, and you can 3D print it for public engagement. And so I have some examples here because, you know, I can't give a whole paper on touch without bringing things for you to touch. Um, I was expecting everything to look a little bit like this. I was expecting all these 3D prints to look like this. So I'm thinking, but what, like, how can you do this? Like, what, what does this actually mean? Rather conveniently, uh, some postdocs were advertised at exactly the same time at the Fitzwilliam Museum with Dan Pett, um, exactly looking at how we might engage 3D printing in a heritage context to make it a useful kind of approach. Uh, I worked with, I managed to apply, mostly using my scepticism for 3D printing as a mechanism to kind of getting the job. And um, I chatted and we, I was like, well, let's really think about this. And I um, I was a bit surprised. Then I started 3D prints that can feel a little bit more like this. Um, these are much higher quality. They don't just sort of fulfill the uh, physical shape and size of an object. They also have a weight to them. They have temperature, they have a touch. I'm hoping at some point someone might grab some of these. Uh, if I leave them here long enough, we'll have a play with while I'm speaking. Um, and to quote, oh, I haven't got the right no, I don't have that side there. To, to quote Dr. James Taylor of the University of York, why do you have a Kinea form in your bag? They're that kind of good quality um, that they're really useful. So I was engaged on this project and I was thinking, okay, maybe, maybe there is something here. Maybe this is valuable. Maybe this does line up to something like this, which is um, this is produced by potted history. It's just a votive eye. It's made of pottery. It's ceramic. You know, it has all of those wider textual needs. Um, and I need to slide my slides down so I can see what I'm going to do my next. So I went into the Fitzwilliam Museum um, and we installed a series of prints in the gallery. This was part of a project called Initially Do Not Touch and then Do Touch. These, um, we installed these prints to try and stop people touching stuff in the museum that was then becoming harmed by the people touching stuff. Um, I did some observations, watched how people interact with these 3D prints. Um, and I mean, yeah, the feedback was great. They were like, yeah, that's really nice. I can really, really touch that. That's really cool. However, it didn't have quite the, uh, the impact we'd hoped for because mostly what happened was people would touch the 3D print and then they'd go to compare it with the original object. <laughs> Shocking. I mean, that's exactly what I would do probably if I wasn't quite sure. And there are a whole like, range of reasons for this, and particularly in the setting, there's language barriers. It's really hard to create a sign that says don't touch or do touch. Like thinking about how you might visualise that is really difficult. So my first step was then to think about how we might do this in a more meaningful way. Um, so this was at the Polar Museum. Um, we did a 3D model of this object and put it on the outside 
of a case next to where the original object was. This seems to work really well. Uh, I did that thing in academia where my postdoc was coming to an end. I applied for a job and had to leave my postdoc a few months early. So did only had like one day of um, ability to kind of watch, um, do some observations in the gallery. And this seemed to work pretty well. Um, however, it did make me think a little bit more about this 3D printing process. Um, what was what I'd like to think about in sort of elsewhere is the idea that I was making this object and calibrating it, but I wasn't allowed to touch the original to get that sensation of touch to really think about, does this feel right? As it were, I can calibrate it in the same way. Um, so that was quite interesting. And that made me think a little bit more about how we can use these more effectively. This object then went into their handling collection, and I hope it's still being used. Which brings me to St. Topless of Beckett right, landing in at Sandwich and the Medieval Animals Project. So I arrived uh, at Canterbury Christchurch after yet another, after COVID, after another postdoc and all that kind of nonsense. Um, and Diane uh, got in touch with me almost immediately when I arrived. And she was like, I've been working on these, this project. I want to create kind of a tactile engagement for um, my, to, to, to engage students. Um, there's this really cool object at BNA. It's about this big. So that's like a meter high. Um, and it's a, it shows St. Thomas Beckett arriving at Sandwich. So things I didn't know about Thomas Beckett, or most people know the fact he was martyred in Canterbury Cathedral, and that's what he's famous for. Uh, but he also performed a load of miracles related to animals. I'm not that kind of medievalist. I don't know all of the details of them. Anyway, this shows him arriving um, at Sandwich, and uh, she was going to be putting on a mystery play with a load of Sen children and wanted to have some kind of way of engaging them with the story while she was telling it that they could kind of touch and play with. Um, so we went up to the B&A, we did the classic, obviously, I am going to show a video of a 3D model because clearly no one has seen a structure from motion video before. Um, so we, we did the classic scanning of the object um, and we produced uh, this rather beautiful, much higher quality, but incredibly expensive 3D print. It was a thousand pounds. The kids loved it. They really engaged with, with playing with it, with touching it, and apparently it really kept them occupied while they were learning about Tom Speckett before they went on to produce this mystery play. So that was great. Um, there you go, there's a, there's a visual until the, the nice object can get passed around. But again, the, we were really concerned that, uh, well, I wasn't because I believe in touching and breaking things. Because that's the whole point of 3D printing, right? It's replicable, you can just print another copy. Mm -hmm. um, but apparently a thousand pounds is quite hard to source. Uh, so what do I know? Um, so we, we kind of had another think again about what we might want to do with this. Uh, so cue the most terrifying, one of the more terrifying experiences of my life. Um, we went to St. Thomas's which apparently is Thomas a. Beckett, named after Thomas Beckett, Catholic Primary School in Canterbury. Um, and we did assembly, 200 children speaking in front of, much more difficult than speaking in front of 200 adults. Um, and we talked to him about uh, Beckett's animal mir miracles. Um, and we went on to do a series of craft activities with their year fives. Uh, and for those, we produced a load of these little objects. Um, these are the same structural motion thing, slide down, but they're see-through, so I'll let I'm that last one on. Um, and we did some stained glass window making, which was a really great activity. Uh, this is also lasagna stained glass window. It transpires lasagna is kind of translucent, so you can draw on it and create stained glass. Um, but what's really exciting about doing this is it got the kids really excited about not just the story of Thomas Beckett, not just about learning about the heritage, but thinking about different types of evidence we have for medieval animals and medieval heritage. So I was frankly amazed because they went out and they knew, they already knew about stained glass as a source of information for medieval animals. They already knew about archaeological material and finding skeletons and things like that. Um, they already knew about vestuaries and these medieval images. Uh, and what I hadn't thought about was they were already in their heads putting together all these different, um, different pieces of evidence to think more about heritage. So it worked really, really well. So this kind of rambling talk was highlighting that 3D printing is really fucking cool. Uh, sorry, it was really exciting and really yeah. useful as a technique uh, to, to work with. Um, but also, it's not necessarily just the 3D print that's really interesting. It's what we can do with the 3D prints afterwards. The kids loved colouring these in and that they loved the fact that they could then take them away. It really got them thinking about a wider range of digital, um, uh, digital, uh, not digital, what am I saying? Wider range of, sort of sensory approaches. And they really like touching the stuff. They really came away with it, engaged with the fact that they got to play with something that was 3D. Um, and unlike 
when I'd looked at other sort of 3D uh, printing kind of technologies, they didn't just get excited about the fact that these objects were 3D printed. They were excited about the fact that they were making their own stained glass windows. They were excited about comparing what they were producing with pictures they could see in the book of different pieces of stained glass as well. And obviously, as I said earlier, for the, uh, for the Sen, Sen sort of learning experiences, they really enjoyed the fact that they had something that grounded them while they were learning about these things. So thank you very much. I hope that's <laughs>